Uh, my name's Mark Higgins, I work here at UMATS, I'm the responsible for training. Uh, and I've just arrived from the UK, where I was visiting the, uh, the Met Office in the UK, so the, the Veterdienst um, in, the, in the UK, uh, which was quite fun. I was thinking about this talk, actually, because one of the people I was talking to was actually, conveniently, I prepared this before I ended up talking to him, was looking at that. <coughs> And what this is, there's a lovely little storm brewing in the middle of the Atlantic right now. Um, and so what's happening is weather forecasters, so this is the Atlantic, this is the uh, eastern seaboard of the US. What you're seeing here, you see the kind of red colours, you're seeing strong winds. Um, and what he was doing was forecasting for ships in the UK shipping areas and the Atlantic. And, uh, so I was reminded of a little bit of our history. Now, if you've heard me talk before, sorry, you've seen this picture before. But this is where, this is why he's doing that job. So this is, this image was about lunchtime yesterday, or oh, sorry, last night. And at about this time, so early evening, 25th of October, 1859, so a little bit of time ago, um, this boat here, it's called the Royal Charter. It's just traveled from Australia and it's going to Liverpool in the UK. It's about 150 nautical miles away from home. So on a scale of Australia to home, it's there. Um, a storm very similar to that one kicks up. And uh, almost everyone on the boat is killed. And, and this was the start. So at this point in time, uh, telecommunications technology is just, and the telegraph is just starting to be available. The scientific knowledge of the weather is just starting to kick off. Observations are just starting to get underway. And so this is the start of, or the birthplace of um, what we would call operational meteorology. And the reason I mention that is because that's a little bit about where we come in. So, if you're a storm in the Atlantic, you can't hide anymore, whereas previously you could. So a lot of the rooms behind me, if you're here tomorrow, not that one, that one's very empty. Um, more that one, and the one, the one down there. Um, if you're here tomorrow, we'll do a bit of a tour, and we'll, we'll talk a bit more about what's happening in the environment around here. But we are, we're a satellite agency, we're quite spacey. When you come here, you see the spaciness outside. We've got satellites and models, you know, the models of the satellites, and it's, it's all quite spacey. But, of course, actually, this is where we've come from, is the, the protection of life and property. Or the, so, the guy in the UK who does this job, the, the desk he's on, is called Safety at Life at Sea, uh, which is the name of the convention that was set up after the Titanic sunk. So, that's the, it gives you a sense of the job that they're doing. Now, this guy's a scientist. He's working with data. Um, in fact, one of his problems is how to get the data into his display system because his display system won't properly look at that. So one of his problems is uh, he can't very easily visualise wind vectors that are on a satellite track. So this is a satellite observation of wind um, in his display system, which is one of the things we might play with over the next couple of days. So we've got geostationary satellites. Satellite... It's, uh, he's in, oh. Um, so you've got the Earth, satellite, the satellite is orbiting, but its orbit doesn't move with respect to the surface of the Earth, because the Earth rotates and the satellite rotates at the same speed, so it's geostationary, 36,000 kilometres away, always seen with the Earth. Um, and from there you can take regular <coughs> images, so every 15 minutes or every 5 minutes. Polar orbit, um, zipping around the Earth like this, the Earth rotates underneath your orbit and so you get a couple of views of the Earth each day, one in the morning, one in the evening. With the images, you can watch clouds um, and storms and things developing in real time. With the polar orbit and stuff, you're, you're closer to the Earth, you're only 800 kilometers away, so you can get much better data. And you've got much more sensors, so that one there, polar orbiting data, a lot of stuff hanging off the bottom of it. So this thing's it's only got a couple of camera and a few other instruments. So you're getting an awful lot of information, and all that information is going into the computer models. Um, now, what, all the stuff I'm talking about so far, it's very tuned to a particular set of use, uses. It's used by the 
operational weather folk. And that's actually going to be a problem. We're going to come across that there. So there you go. That's the same Atlantic storm. It's looking very pretty. So that's from a polar orbit, quite close in. Lovely clouds. That's actually off the, the <coughs> Sentinel-3, the, um, the object instrument. And uh, of course, from the geostationary orbit, it's not just us who's doing this. There's uh, folk in the US, Japan, China, Korea, all with um, satellites in orbit. And so we share this stuff. Yeah, there's that Atlantic storm. That's from last night, this image. So there's our operational forecast from the UK and other places. Looking at that. Lovely. And some of the data we're going to be playing with over the next couple of days, if you're staying for the hackathon, gets away from just looking at clouds. So a lot of operational meteorology, we start out, we look at clouds, and that's quite cool. Um, but then, folks discover you can look at a whole bunch of other stuff from space. Um, there's things called coccolithus. Did you talk about coccolithus? I didn't. I talked about phytoplankton. Oh, not they're really cool. I know. You can see them from you can see them from space, and they're how big are they? Like that big or smaller? Very, very small. Very, very Less than two microns, so tiny, tiny, yeah. tiny. Yeah, so tiny, tiny, tiny. Like. But if you get a stack of them together, they they change the colour of the water. Now, I'm, I'm I come from a physics physics background. So um, a lot of my stuff is about measuring what you can see. And when you start putting these little kind of coccolithophory things in water, and a ton of them, you start changing the colour of it, that then becomes an observation. Okay, and we can use satellite technology to see stuff. And so this is what this instrument is about, this ocean uh, land colour instrument, ocean. You can also measure sea surface temperature. Did you mention sea surface temperature? Yeah. Cool. Um, and altimeters. Did you mention altimeters? Good. <laughs> Good. Like altimeters. Um, altimeters are really, really important. In, a little bit of our politics. So you met that politics. We're an international organisation. We've got thirty odd member states. Um, if you want to join our club, you have to participate in two of the programmes: the geostationary programme and the low Earth orbit programme. There is a thing called an optional programme, and that's the altimeter one. The real problem we have is this with with this word optional. What it means is, if you don't contribute to this program, you can still be a member of the club. It doesn't mean it's scientifically optional. Because if we stop having altimeters, we stop understanding how sea surface is rising, or not, but it is, under, under, under climate change. The continuation of this record is stunningly important. And in fact, the continuation of all the records, what we're learning with these satellite records is the more and more data we've got, the more important it is to have the records. Yeah, so there you go. So this is something else that our UK friend was looking at. These are waves um, from our temperature. So looking at significant wave height, where you've got the orange and green colours, you've got nice big waves. So that's that storm travelling across the Atlantic. What happens is, of course, when the wind blows, it builds up lots of waves, and actually you get, as the storm travels, the wave field will grow with it. Previously, we used to get observations from ships. They would radio in and say, the seas are quite heavy here, it's a bit wavy. Um, now what happens is you don't get those because the weather forecasters are doing their job and if you're in a ship you go there's going to be big waves there i'm not going i'm go around the waves um, and you can actually see there's a lovely animation done from the forecasters in the us of a, a big storm and you can see all the ship reports um, following the storm as the ships are around the storm so they're not in it they're just sort of staying in the safe parts uh, which is a credit to our our, our role but not very good for observations. Um, yeah, sea surface temperature, so temperature of the skin, you can see, ocean colour, which Hayden's talks about. I love it when you, when you start zooming in this, in this, you start seeing the little structures in the water. And this is to do with the, the flow of the oceans. Lovely. Lovely. So, here is our problem. Um, we've got two things that basically happen with our images. People do pretty stuff. Um, so invariably, when somebody has a baby here, um, obviously not here, they go to hospitals, but... Um, <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I mean? Or, or they get married, we, we get the, the, the image of the Earth for when their baby was born. Or when they got married, and you know, sign it or stuff, or put it in a nice card and sign it. So you're taking something pretty that's got a meaning for that person, um, and it's lovely. Or, we do... Um, operational weather services and really heavy-duty research institutions. 
So that is who we're tuned to serve. We're mainly tuned to serve this stuff and we let a little bit of the prettiness leak out. There is a ton of data that we are trying to make more publicly available. Everything I've just pointed out, everything to do with the clouds, to do with the waves, to do with the sea surface height, to do with the sea surface temperature, to do with all the little, um, the formal word I think is um, ocean biogeochemistry, all the little bugs in the water, yeah? So we've got massive research institutes, huge great universities, operational agencies, and pretty pictures. My assumption is that between there, there is a ton of stuff that people can be doing with these data. If only we open it up a bit, and we've done that a bit, and people who know a little bit about the data, but maybe a bit more about playing with the data, come and play with it and see what you can do. And so that's what we're going to be going over the next couple of days. Um, so we've come up with three challenges. I've been inspired by your use of the GIF. <laughs> um, so, thing number one, can you, <laughs> can you do something useful? This is the Acme, Acme self-disintegrating pistol, the, uh, the un, unuseful thing. Can you do something useful with the data? So, for example, some of the ideas we've had when we were, were talking, there's a kind of a classical, if I want to go to the beach, um, it's quite a long way to go to the beach from here, as you know. So one needs to be a bit prepared. Well, one wants to know if it's nice to go swimming. Will I be warm when I enter the water? Will it be nice for me to go swimming in whatever beach I go to? There's another version of that application, which um, a little bit is tried in the US of, if you fall off of a boat, um, what's your survival time? So there's the kind of the fun application side of using sea surface temperature of, is it nice to go swimming? The other one is, what's your, what's your survival time? How quickly do you need to be rescued if you fall off a boat? Do you need specialist survival gear? Um, so this, this is some of the applications of some of the sea surface temperature data. Now, within operational services, that's addressed using huge amounts of technology. Um, is there an app version of that? Is there a way of um, integrating some of the sea surface temperature data some of the altimeter data and other forms of data, um, so uh, data from fisheries, for example, that makes the data more useful, that potentially somebody could build a little business app of. Um, so we're quite interested in you know, what happens when you take these data outside of the, the research and the university and the operational environment, mix them with other data, what's the creative possibilities? Um, most of you are old enough to remember Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Ferris Bueller's Day Off? Anyone? Anyone? Okay, yeah, ten of us. Um, it was a very funny film from a long time ago. Uh, educational. So when we make the pretty pictures, that's kind of nice. But actually, we need to be much more aware of the earth and ocean, the place we call home, and our impact in it and on it. It's one of our, our life support systems. So are there ways that we can visualize the data that help people connect to the ocean? I mean, particularly here in Darmstadt, the ocean's miles away. So it's quite easy to go, yeah, I, I don't have an impact on the ocean. My day-to-day -day life doesn't have an impact on the ocean. What happened in the ocean doesn't happen, you know, it doesn't have an effect on me. Until I look at just about everything I'm wearing, uh, yep. Yeah. Probably, maybe not the shoes actually, just about everything I'm wearing has traveled by ship at some point. So an awful lot of the stuff we have in its production cycle has traveled by ship. So in, at least in that respect, we are connected to the oceans. So are there ways of helping us learn, this is what the detecting thing, learn about or feel more connected to the oceans? <laughs> and the other one is open. So, We've got our data on uh, a couple of servers. We've got the data um, available for exploitation. It's free and open. But sometimes it feels like it's free and open in this kind of way. You open the door and there's another door, right? So some of you may wish to play with and break the ways that we're trying to make the data open. Um, some of you might want to, for example, uh, write something in Jupyter Notebooks using some of the Python scripts to make it easier for other people to actually access and play with the data for the first time. 
or play with the, the web map server we've got running and to see are there ways of actually people accessing data that way in a better way or the, uh, the thing called the Copernicus Online Data um, Access uh, Center, so the CODA, which has got an API, which is just, can you make it easier for people who aren't in the operations and research world to get hold of this data? Because one of the barriers, if we start chopping down barriers, the use of this stuff is going to explode. There's an example from the United States Geological Survey. They used to charge for Landsat data. And then they realized that all of their customers were in the US government, plus a few other people. And so they were thinking, hold on, we've got this really expensive system so that the government can ask the rest of the government for money to give data that the government has actually already paid for. This is bananas. Right. It's free. Then they actually start improving the accessibility and the openness of the data and the usage of that data, and therefore the value of society has gone through the roof. So this data, there's no cost, it's free, it's open. But can we actually make it so that the door is actually open? So that's one of the, the challenges we've got. Uh, thank you, tomorrow. So that's uh, where we're thinking of the data. So we've got a ton of data there. And what we're really after is inspiring people to play and see if we can generate some value, which is outside of this huge research operations thing, a bit more than the prettiness. Um, which I think will be a ton of fun. So I'm quite looking forward to it. Yeah, that's me. Thank you very much.